keep forgetting I can't use this. I keep forgetting I can't use this control. Is that Everything. When you're done with the first page, you just, I don't know if you click it, you just take it off. Yeah, why not? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to scream. I don't have a microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, that's good. So I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Kalber, Jack Kalber, as everybody knows. Uh, he's our residence, and we appreciate your lecture today. Here, uh, Mr. Dr. Jack Kalber. Oh! <laughs> okay. Thank you, Arjun. And um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. You don't need this. I don't need that, no. Um, You're not going to examine me, are you? Well, all you women say, ah. Uh, <laughs> now all you men bend over. <laughs> OK, enough with the ferality. We have a, a lot to cover here today. What I'm going to do is give you a very broad overview of where we were in cancer in 1970 and where we are today. So uh, you'll be pretty, you'll be overwhelmed at how far we've come, even though we have a long way to go. <laughs> and the, cancer is a word derived, like so many English words, from the Greek. And uh, kicking out is the word for crab. Don't check my pronunciation, Harry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and we can understand why crab was used to describe uh, the process of cancer since there are tentacles that go out from the cells. <clears throat> uh, and I know, of course, the crab is also a constellation and an astrological symbol. <clears throat> But put simply, cancer is a gang of rogue cells that are multiplying out of control. That, in an essence, is what cancer is. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> As late as the 1970s, there was little or no treatment for cancer. If you, you know, you would go to your family physician, who was usually a general practitioner, and if he recognized you had cancer, there was little to nothing he could do. Um, there weren't any cancer specialties that existed to speak of. And, in the 70s, cancer was the province of only surgeons. They, if they could extirpate the, the tumor, that would provide some sustenance for a while, but usually it would uh, metastasize and spread, and nothing else could be done. So in essence, cancer was a death sentence in 1970. And I'm going to demonstrate to you today that that isn't the case today by any means. In the 1970s, how many cancer centers do you think existed in the US, the entire US? Anybody want to take a guess? Three. There was three. A lot of people think you just said cancer cells. What you said was cancer centers. Oh, I'm sorry, cancer centers. There were billions of cancer cells, but of cancer centers, there were three. There was Sloan Kettering Institute in New York City. There was MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. There was Roswell Park in Buffalo, New York. And if you really stretch things a little bit, there was Fox Chase in Philadelphia. But that was it. 
And to refer people to those centers was really difficult because they were handling all the people in the country. And you notice there was nothing in the mid part of the country, nothing in the Midwest to speak of, and nothing on the West Coast. <clears throat> well, there were people who were really concerned with what we could do with cancer. And there were some basic scientists who were making advances that showed that maybe we could really do something serious about treating cancer. So people like Sidney Farber up at um, Harvard was treating kids. He was treating uh, children, you've heard of the Jimmy Fund, and he was treating some ch children with leukemia, with World War II uh, derivatives of mustard gas, and uh, then eventually vincristine and a few other drugs that uh, showed promise. And you know, there's a tremendous emotional side when you see a three, four, five, six, seven year old with leukemia. And so there was that emotion, and there was this appeal for the Jimmy Fund. And uh, we were using that as a way to convince the members of Congress to get on board, to think in terms of a program that would attack cancer. Mary Lasker, famous uh, anthropologist, I mean, uh, not anthropologist, um, oh, the Duke of Philanthropist, the Duke of, <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, Mary Lasker was quite a remarkable lady. And uh, she, in fact, she created the Lasker Awards. And people who have won the last awards, both either on the clinical side or the basic science side, have gone on to win Nobel Prizes. And uh, working with Sidney Farber, they convinced a senator, Senator Lister Hill in Alabama, and um, John Fogarty in Rhode Island on the House side. And they introduced a bill a bill that they were calling the National Cancer Act of 1971. And since we were so successful with John Kennedy's uh, shot for the moon, they said, let's make it a moon approach for cancer. So what we did was approach NASA, and we asked for all of their famous Nobel Prize winning physicists to meet with us in Bethesda, Washington, Maryland, to discuss a, a plan for how we can approach the war on cancer. It was actually, we used that word, war on cancer. It was scheduled, a two, two day meeting was scheduled. And I remember where, there we all sat down at nine o'clock in the morning, started to discuss things. And the protocol was that we were going to explain to the physicists what we were up against in terms of the biological uh, issues involving cancer development. And lo and behold, by 12 o'clock, the physicists got up and told us all, your problem is much, much greater than what we had to face going to the moon. A biological system is so much more complex than the physical, where we know what the parameters are. You guys don't even know what the parameters are. Thank you, we're gone. And the meeting was ended in half a day. So it gives you some appreciation for how difficult things were. <laughs> uh, a uh, DePew Foundation was asked to do a Vox Pop to see how people felt about diseases. And the question was asked, what disease do you fear more than any other disease? And they submitted their answers. What disease do you think it was most feared by people? Tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Tuberculosis, no. Any other? 
It's not cancer. Blindness. Blindness. Blind disease, we didn't even know blind disease. That's not what I said. Blindness. Blindness. You can see it here. <laughs> Pen and cheat it, she can see it. But blindness was the first uh, most feared uh, malady that people submitted. And then second was cancer. But that was enough to convince the Congress to go ahead with their bill. <clears throat> And I can tell you, uh, uh, President Nixon was the president at the time, and uh, I worked very closely with, on this bill with many people. And um, <clears throat> the person who, uh, Yarbrough from Oregon, got defeated, and he was the one who was running with the bill, and uh, then it was picked up by Kennedy. And Nixon was not in favor of it at all. He said, no, I don't, I'm not interested. I might even veto it. And you know, all presidents um, don't favor domestic programs, domestic funding, because they have no control over the budget on the domestic side. So they favor money going to the Defense Department, because that money they can control. So he was no different than other presidents in that regard. But when he found out that Kennedy picked up the banner and started to run for it, there was no way he was going to let Kennedy get the benefit of saying he's responsible for the National Cancer Act. And so that's when he came on board. As an anecdotal aside, on his deathbed, and I know how many scars I have on my back, because of that situation at that time, on his deathbed, he was asked, what, were you, what are you most proud of in your administration? And of course, most people forget, he'd say, well, opening up China. No, he said, the National Cancer Act. I threw up, and that's the way it went. <laughs> so. Okay, there's your War on Cancer, National Cancer Act of 1971. It was the first nationally supported health program in the history of any country in the world. That's how significant it was. The act called for the creation of 25 so-called comprehensive cancer centers, which in this case comprehensive means there is a clinical dimension to it and a basic science dimension to it. So, and cancer was becoming a respectable disease with basic scientists because some of the basic science was lending itself to a disease process, which is not always the case. So that really gave it a, a, the whole cancer field a real energy push. <clears throat> Okay, I told you what existed, what centers existed. As a comparison, to just emphasize how far we have come, today there are 65 comprehensive cancer centers in the country. They are overwhelmingly, of course, based at universities, because if you're going to combine basic science with clinical science, it has to be done at a university environment. And um, in most cases, by the way, if anybody has any questions as I'm going along, don't hesitate to ask them. <clears throat> so 65 comprehensive cancer centers and over 3,000 community centers. Uh, my friend Dick Taylor is the one who created the uh, community centers. He worked for me. And I fired him. And he went out and developed all these cancer centers around the country. So it shows you how much I know. No, actually, he was an entrepreneur rather than a scientist. And I said, Dick, you know, you're really not a scientist. You shouldn't be at the National Institutes of Health. And he agreed. And he said, I did him a favor. So, But he is the person who uh, is responsible for over 3,000 community centers around the country. And he, uh, he's not in need of money. <laughs> yes, Jackie. What do you mean 
a community center is a center that devotes itself to cancer and has clinicians, people who are trained and, and board certified in certain um, clinical, cancer clinical areas. So they have a concentration uh, in, in, and an interest in, in cancer. Now, that brings me to another point. <clears throat> um, let's see where I thought I had a chart on that. Um, yeah, okay, here. Um, to give you some idea of how complex this subject is, you know, we always, when with our war on cancer, everybody was hoping, especially members of Congress, let's find the magic bullet. The magic bullet that will cure cancer, just like you find a vaccine for a disease like polio and wipe it out. That's what the goal was. Well, unfortunately, cancer is not one disease. It is now recognized that cancer is a rubric for what we know are at least 135 different diseases. And I mean, I worked in pathology for a number of years, and you know, I had my, more than my chance of reading slides. And you could study a tumor and find five different types, identify five different types of cancer within the same tumor. So, give you some idea of how complex. Now, just for simplicity's sake, Overwhelmingly, cancer can be divided into two major categories. Bloodborne or solid tumor. What is bloodborne? Bloodborne are the leukemias and the lymphomas. <clears throat> what are the solid tumors? Breast, prostate, uterus, ovary, brain, etc. Now, unfortunately, well, when children will, became leukemics before 1970, they had, there was about a 100% death rate. Today, to give you some idea of the progress with leukemias, it is now considered to be 98% curable. 98%. <clears throat> Leukemias overwhelmingly occur in children with peak ages between five and nine. It can happen in, in adults. And of course, there are things like multiple myeloma, which is a bloodborne disease, which occurs in old age. I, I, I have a lot of friends who have had several friends who have been hit by multiple myeloma. I call it tired blood disease. And we are doing better, but there's still we don't have it, the 98% now. There is a downside with the 98%. And I'm going to show you that when you treat bloodborne cancers with chemotherapy, which is one of the treatments that had to be developed, and we'll talk about that next, you are treating a poison with another poison. So, when the children survive the leukemia end of things, 20 to 40 years later, which is the, the duration of time that a carcinogen takes to take, to take its effect. So everybody here, you don't have to worry about carcinogens at this stage of game. If you take them in, you know, it's not gonna affect you. But, but 40 years later, these children come down with secondary tumors, usually um, solid tumors. So that's the trade-off. What kind of tumors did you say? Excuse me? What kind of tumors did you say? Solid tumors. Solid tumors. Solid tumors. So, um, now, unfortunately, we've done so well with the blood-borne cancers. But they only make up 15% of all cancers. The other 85% are 
is the stuff that you and I have to deal with, solid tumors. <clears throat> Now, in 1970, as I said, there were no treatments. We didn't even have any specialists. And with Sidney Farber working with those drugs up in Boston, um, we had to create a specialty, which we did. There's a specialty in internal medicine now that is recognized as an, an oncologist. An oncologist is a person who treats cancer patients. So, um, surgery, as I said earlier, was the only uh, treatment there was in the 70s, if you could see the tumor and get it out. And um, to give you a, a really extreme example, when the um, NIH addressed the Consensus Development Program. I was the deputy director of that office. The Consensus Development Program addressed issues that would um, translate so that the practitioner could get the benefit of new research. Um, Dr. Fredrickson appeared every year uh, the director of NIH has to appear before Congress to justify the uh, budget. By the way, the National Institutes of Health now has a budget of $38 billion. Billion. Shows you how expensive research in cancer is. Well, the very first topic we addressed was breast cancer. And why? Because, believe it or not, when women were diagnosed with breast cancer in, say, the late 70s, the procedure was to do a Halstead procedure. Halstead was a British physician that did his work in 1894. And here in 1970, we were using the same procedure, no change. What was the procedure? Extreme treatment. Lop off the breast and the axilla. So you may, women, many of you here may remember the Reach for Recovery program because of the edema of the arm and women had to do this kind of thing all day long to get rid of some of that edema and relieve the pain. Well, um, Fodi in Italy was the first to introduce a segmental in the segmental, he was able to show by a clinical trial, double-blind study. Double-blind study means the physician doesn't know and the patient doesn't know the process. And he was able to show that the segmental is no different than the, ex the, the extreme surgery in both, except for very, very few cases, say 3%, 2%. The segmental works. And that's what's done today overwhelmingly. Um, but there is an issue with breast cancer, as you know. We are all products of our genetics. And there are some people, some women, who are prone to breast cancer. And if you're prone to breast cancer, you're also prone to ovarian carcinoma. And uh, Ashkenazi Jews have a very high incidence of this, of this disease because of a gene called BARCA1 and BARCA2, or BRAC1 and BRAC2. And that can be detected easily. So there are some women, and of course the most famous one that you know about is Angelina Jolie, who prophylactically had her breasts removed now, you know, they can be very nice reconstructive surgery, so a person really doesn't know anything. But uh, at any rate, as a protection against getting the tumor. 
Um, I dealt with Rose Kushner, who wrote the book, and put tremendous pressure on the surgeons to do a two-stage procedure. Just, and I'm sharing some stuff behind the curtain with you here. Um, when a person's up in the surgical ward, usually the top floor, or the uh, surgical suite, and then the uh, specimen, which would be a frozen specimen, would come down to the pathologist. And I'd be part of a team of five. And we'd read, look at the slide, and if three of us said it's cancer, the word would go up and the surgeon would the whole bit. And then two weeks later, we'd get so-called fixed slides, because it takes two weeks to do a fixed slide. And maybe 25% of those were not cancer. Oh, and the breast came off needlessly. So that happened. But we learned. But we learned. And Rose Kushner said, we want to have a two-stage procedure, which means this, the, the, the uh, biopsy takes place in the surgical ward one day, and two weeks later, the decision is made as to what the surgeon is going to do. And Zoltan, being a surgeon here, knows that didn't sit well with the surgeons at all. Let me tell you, surgeons are pretty, you know, they're, they're kingpins in, in, in the world of medicine. We joke about they don't know anything, but they do everything. So, so. Yeah, you know that little thing that you know about. The internist knows everything and does nothing. That's right. Because <laughs> they refer you to the surgeon knows nothing but does everything. And the, the psychiatrist knows nothing but does nothing. And the pathologist knows everything but can't, it's too late. <laughs> anyway, just a little aside. So that gives you some idea. We went to this two-stage procedure, and that's what is employed today. So those, those um, needless surgeries don't occur. But I've got to tell you, I used to go to, I was on the board at the New York Academy of Sciences, and I go up there monthly. And Guy Robbins, who is in charge of the biggest breast cancer service in the world, at Sloan Kettering Institute. And here I told him about, you know, you gotta do the segmental guy. Because we used to, he had an, he lived in Connecticut, but had an apartment in New York. And whenever I came, he wanted me to stay with him because he loved the company. And we'd finish a bottle of scotch together. And, uh, but you think, do you think he would change? Jack, I am convinced that taking the whole Breast and the and the axilla off saves lives. He was that convinced, and so the old guys were not easily convinced. It was it was a hard sell, but that's when you're dealing with surgeons. You know, you gotta, surgeons are a different breed, sort of, sort of weird people. Okay. Now, so when do you want to have, have time for a rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> So well, we all love our surgeon, don't we? You know, I mean, we have to. Um, now, the chemotherapy I told you about, that didn't even exist. And now, of course, it's a very big specialty, chemotherapy. Um, and most cancers are treated not with a single drug, but a combination of drugs. Non-Hodgkin's leukemia, for instance, is treated with three different drugs and very successful. Um, another method of treatment is radiation. Now, radiation does cause cancer. Do you know that there are certain occupations that uh, make you more prone for cancer? And for instance, flight attendants have a higher incidence of cancer. Anybody guess why? Altitude. The high altitude and the gamma rays that get through over 20, 30 years in the plane. So that explains why Gordon acts straight sometimes. 
<laughs> Where are you, Gordy? Um, is there anyone? <laughs> um, but uh, yes, and but it also has become a tremendous tool. So we had to train people to become radiation therapists because radiation people were only diagnosticians. You know, they checked you to see if you fell and broke an arm or broke a leg. That was, was all diagnostic, no treatment. But then we had to create the specialty of radiation therapists who are now called radiation oncologists. And you know, they treat you with big high energy physics particles, gamma rays, beta rays, um, really big powerful rays. And they do this hand in glove with a physicist. The physicist has to do the, um, the collimation of the beam so that it, it, it really is going to hit the, the tumor and not the uh, adjacent tissue. And uh, so the radiation oncologist works hand in glove with these specially trained physicists. So you can see we've come a long, long way. Um, and now immunotherapy is the new approach, targeted treatment so that you can use the body's own immune system to treat your tumor. And that gets really complicated and involved, I'll just touch on it. Uh, also, another thing we had to create was blood specialists. Blood specialists are called hematologists. Well, now there are hematologists who specialize only in oncology oncologic hematologists. All of that done since 1970. Okay, now let's get down to the nitty gritty. What causes cancer? I'll start reading off some things that you can we'll talk about. The environment, carcinogens in the environment, the air, the water, what do you drink, the air you breathe, all plays a role. Early on, in the late 1970s, it was reasoned that maybe as much as 85% of cancers are caused by carcinogens. Today, we have reworked that and recognized no. The body has some pretty good defenses. So it's more like maybe 30%, 35%, depending, hard to say. Depends on the situation. As I said, certain occupations um, lend themselves to cancer. Um, painters, even, even hobby painters, paint, paint women or men who paint with oils, and in closed room for 30, 40 years, have a higher incidence of hepatomas, which is liver cancer. Um, carpenters, people who work with very fine sawdust, have a high incidence of nasopharyngeal cancer. Um, truck drivers, truck drivers who drive these diesel trucks across the country, have a higher incidence of bladder cancer. And I can go on and on and on. So there are those occupations. Organic chemists have a much higher incidence of hepatomas. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, there are genetics in families, so-called cancer families. Uh, Lynch at Creighton University was the first to do all of these. Uh, these footprints, these genetic footprints by family. And as you know, as I mentioned, of course, with breast cancer with women, but it also applies to men in terms of um, prostate cancer, happens in a father, happens in a brother, um, 
and a number of different things, cancers. So know your genetics. Certainly make sure you're aware of, the, of what your parents died of. Hopefully you know about what your grandparents died of and, as, and your siblings and aunts and uncles, if you can. Because all of that put together uh, gives the physician a picture of what you are susceptible to. And we are all susceptible to some kind of disease, whether it's heart disease, cancer, um, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Any questions on that? Is there a problem with insurance if you find out that you have the breast cancer gene? No, not today. Not today. The question was, uh, does insurance discriminate against people having these, this propensity or identification of BRAC1 or 2? <clears throat> okay, now this is the big one. Habits. People who smoke, of course, are going to be at risk for what? Hmm? Well, let me tell you. I tell people who smoke, you know, not only are you at risk for lung cancer, there is three times a chance of getting a heart attack from smoking than lung cancer. But of course, there's no question there's a direct causal relationship between lung cancer and smokers. But smoking doesn't only cause lung cancer or heart disease, it also causes increased colorectal cancer, increased bladder cancer, increased pancreatic cancer, increased mouth pharyngeal cancer. That's just some of them. So there's nothing redeeming about smoking. Alcohol. You know, um, alcohol in moderation. And Harry, what's the thing on moderation? <laughs> very good quantity, very good uh, quality to it. Be wonderful. Harry's our Greek philosopher, <coughs> a Greek expert, and the Greeks say, do everything but do everything in moderation. Yeah. Not only that, it was on a, the Apollo monument to give you some idea. So you do everything, but you do everything in moderation. And that applies to alcohol also. Because alcohol can be a carcinogen. How much is moderate? Oh, I don't know. Five glasses of beer and I know. Uh, well, that's a good question. They say two drinks for men and one drink for women. Now, why is it different for women and men? Anybody have an idea? A lot of things. Body mass. Huh? The body mass. Body mass. Zoltan mentioned body mass. He has to know that. Um, because the blood volume in men is greater than it is in women, so they can detoxify uh, more alcohol than a woman can. So the fatter you are, the more you can drink? Um, well, there is a dimension to that, but we're going to get to that too. As In my mother's side of the family, back as far as we could ever find, had breast cancer, including myself, who had the double subcutaneous and all that. But uh, at least we had a little bit of more, back in those years, too, a little bit more warning in the fact that it was so prominent in our family that we were real diligent. So, and then to, to okay. the body. Well, now, let's take what they were saying to heart. Let's say you know that that you are at risk for breast cancer. What can you do? Well, one thing we know you can do is not eat a whole lot of red meat. Red meat, uh, you know, eating meat is good. The body needs those minerals. Um, but in excess, it's carcinogenic. Increases your risk for colorectal cancer and it increases women's risk for ovarian and breast cancer. Okay? 
You know what I did? Or did I tell you? I had a double subcutaneous mastectomy. And let me help you with social media. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, Yes, absolutely. Um, now, the other thing that helps tremendously and plays a role is exercise. PE teacher. I'm getting all the buttons. Exercise. Exercise is preventative for cancer and diabetes and heart disease. How much exercise? Well, that's, see, my, my Greek expert here has to point out, you can have too much exercise, believe it or not. We know now that extreme athletes, the ones who do lots of marathons, triathlons and such, have a higher risk for a lot of things. Let me point out something that, for instance, young ladies, high school girls in their, you know, 12, 13, 14, their fathers are famous runners and they want their daughter to be a runner and the girl runs marathons and is, you know, the best in her high school running. But there's a penalty to pay in often cases. Those girls in that category who run tremendous amounts day after day, as well as regular marathons, have a much higher risk of leukemia. It affects their blood system. Yes. Because they're amenorrhea. They don't menstruate. It goes, you know, they get to be pretty in their teens and they haven't menstruated yet, and the body doesn't like that. Nothing, the body is a homeostatic organism. Homeostasis is the basis of physiology in the body. And if you go against that homeostasis, yin and yang is the Chinese say. So just remember again, back to the Greeks who seem to have a, uh, pretty good minds in those days, not today. <laughs> hey, Harry, you still talking to me? Okay, now the diet. You know, when we first looked at diet and said that could be implicated, that was an anathema. Are you kidding? We know damn well, many scientists, that diet doesn't play a role in cancer. Well, today, folks, we know it does. Again, lack of exercise, a fatty diet, overweightness, and you increase your risk. What, 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 Viruses cause breast cancer because they found seed particles for the electron microscope, but it, didn't, it wasn't so. Viruses don't play a role in um, breast cancer. But do viruses play a role in cancer? As I say, it was, that was blasphemy um, 40 years ago. Now we know, and this is unbelievable even to me, that may be as much as 25% of cancers are virally induced. The viruses and the bacteria, you know, inherit, were the first things on Earth, and they're going to inherit the Earth the way it goes. So, but anyway, viruses do cause certain cancers, and we're trying to ferret that out. Um, we know, for instance, that overwhelmingly leukemias are virally induced. And that brings us to just think if we could have a vaccine for cancer, all cancer, wow, that would be a euphoric, 
Well, for the first time, we have a vaccine against a cancer. Human papillomavirus. And that is on the increase tremendously throughout this country and others. So if you have any grandchildren, children between the ages of 12 and early 20s, encourage them, in fact, insist that they get the HPV vaccine. Because, I mean, you know, would you keep your child from getting a vaccine for polio? Why would you do it for cancer? And, you know, I don't mean to get um, too gloomy about some of these things, but I have to tell you, um, the habits of children, uh, you know, high school kids are having sex. I mean, that was in Selma and Ade as a rule. Um, depends on where you, yeah, just depends, you know. Um, <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, I'm from New York City, and uh, we didn't see animals, mate, and I always thought milk came in bottles, so uh, we didn't get to learn things that way. But, um, so they do fellatio. The girls do fellatio in the bus, school bus. So there's overwhelmingly high incidence of mouth cancer, oral cancer, esophageal cancer. It's terrible. I mean, that's just the fact of facts from the Centers for Disease Control. So get those kids vaccinated. Get them off the bus. <laughs> I said get them off the bus. Get them off the bus. <laughs> we walk to school. <laughs> okay, I said that now we know immunity plays a big role. When your body is, when your body's immune system is jeopardized, you are prone to any kind of disease, a bacterial infection, pneumonia, uh, maybe a much more serious thing than, than uh, some, you know, unusual bacterium, and other diseases, heart disease, cancer, due to the fact that you have inflammation can put you in jeopardy of getting even cancer. So, if you, as I said, um, an inflamed immune system cause, causing chronic inflammation is a risk factor for esophageal cancer, colon cancer, and pancreatic cancers, which is a terrible cancer, as you well know. I mean, there's very little return <coughs> from that cancer because it's not encapsulated it's under the liver and metastasizes quickly by, by the time you know that. Now, all of us have mutations in our body every day. We're having mutations occur in our extremities, our arms, our legs, and we don't get cancer because we have a thing called proto-oncogenes. Proto-oncogenes are protective against cancer. Proto-oncogenes will see a mutation occur, and usually the mutation takes care of itself. But if it doesn't, then the proto-oncogene will cause the cells, the, the, the developing cancer cells, to commit suicide and die. And that is called, it sounds like an airplane, this proto-oncogene is P53. And cancer families um, are ones who have very low uh, counts of P53. They don't have as much as the average person, and therefore they're more prone to get cancer than the family, cancer families do. Uh, the National Cancer Institute is now developing a cancer genome atlas so that they can see what genes because now we can get down to the genic level with everything and see what genes cause cancer. You know how many they have found so far? 140. Can you imagine? And I can guarantee you that it's got over 200. So 
Now, as total oncogenes become oncogenes, then you get cancer. And my boss, Harold Varmus, who was at the University of California, right here on the West Coast, uh, San Francisco, he and his and Bishop did this work and were the ones who discovered the oncogene. And they got the Nobel Prize for it. Now, what, are the, what is the incidence of cancer in the U.S.? Now, these are statistics for 2015 from the American Cancer Society. And um, does everybody know what the word incidence means? It means how frequently that particular disease is occurring, as opposed to death rates. You have incidence rates, which is how many cancers there are, and then death rates. Those two go epidemiologically hand in glove. Okay, if we look at the incidence rates, the most frequently occurring cancer of all um, uh, the cancers is lung in females and lung in males. Now, I remember the day when the highest incidence was breast cancer in women and lung cancer in men, but the lung cancer caught up with the men because the men smoked way, way before the Second World War, but women only started smoking when it was considered socially acceptable when they started to work in the factories. And then after the war, you may remember the, the tobacco industry uh, advertised these Virginia Slims, and Virginia Slims advertised that if you smoke, you won't gain weight. And I had a, uh, I have a slide of these um, men dressed in suits looking in a uh, uh, cemetery, and the one says to the other, well, you notice they were all thin. <laughs> anyway, just a little point out there. Now, the second most frequently occurring is breast in women and prostate in men. Both of them uh, are endocrine organs, so they have similarities in terms of organ, uh, endocrine function. Got to use my father's pocket watch here, but there's a big clock up there, so I use this every once in a while to keep my father happy with, you know, the fob and all of this. Uh, now, the other one that is really frequent and climbing up is colorectal cancer. If you combine male and female cancers, the most frequently of all cancers is colorectal. So starting at 50, you definitely have to have um, sphygmoidoscopies <coughs> and colonoscopies. And um, those who uh, are found to have polyps, polyps are precancerous, definitely should go in every three years to have it looked at. But if you don't have polyps, every seven to 10 years is fine, up to the age of about 80, 85. So, uh, fortunately, colorectal cancer is a slow going cancer. And to give you an anecdotal story again, just before we came here, uh, my next door, my neighbor across the street, lovely lady Diana and her husband Fred, and I happened to say to them, have you people had your colorectal exams? And Fred said, oh yeah, I had it done just a year ago. I've had it done regularly. I said, Diana, how about you? Oh, I've never had it done. And she was 81. And I said, you've never had it done. You get in there immediately. I gave the name of somebody to go to who I have a lot of confidence in. And it turns out she has stage three colorectal cancer. So she's being treated seriously and seems to be doing well. But if I hadn't gotten on her, she would probably be dead within a month or two. So just to remind I understand that after a certain age, uh, they say don't bother with the 85. <clears throat> when 
don't you get into your 80s? You're good. Because it's pretty slow growing. <laughs> and for, instance, anyway. for instance, prostate cancer. Every one of you guys in here has prostate cancer. But it grows, well, as a rule, um, it grows so slowly that chances are we're all going to die with it than of it. Now, I had my, my uh, partner on the beach, my lifeguard partner, Pete, uh, he died at 56 of prostate cancer because he was in the 15% class that had aggressive prostate cancer, and there are aggressive prostate cancer, but they're only about 15%. One of, the things that you, one of the things that you can tie in what you mentioned before about inflammation causing or increasing the incidence of colorectal cancer is the opposite. You can prevent it with that. You can decrease the incidence with aspirin. Yes, that's right. Thanks, so those that are taking that's right. Those that's aspirin, a, a, a baby aspirin <laughs> dosage a day is protective against colorectal cancer. Well, uh, you know, we can go on as you expected. Where pancreatic cancer is a terrible cancer, but ovarian cancer and ovarian cancer is is. Um, associated with breast cancer and such. But I don't see any need, except one thing. Brain cancer seems to be increasing exponentially. And I, I was an epidemiologist the last part of my years at NIH, and I have my own theory. Since I chaired the carcinogenesis committee meeting in the research triangle, and I'm not a carcinogenesis expert or an organic chemist, but those guys on the committee all were. So I became pretty expert after seven or eight years, I'll tell you. And they implicated diet sodas. Diet sodas are safe, except when they're exposed to a certain amount of heat. And when they're exposed to a certain amount of heat, the, um, the uh, diet part in there, uh, the um, uh, scrolates, and becomes a tremendous carcinogen. So I've, I've asked the Cancer Institute to do a, an epidemiologic study, which is in the process now, it's going to take years, to see um, people who drink a dozen diet sodas a day whether they have a, a, a problem to brain cancer, which is a terrible, of course, a devastating cancer. Because you know as well as I, those sodas are stored uh, in, in these stores on the side or in the truck where they get heated to 90 degrees, 100 degree temperatures. So the dimer, which is organic configuration, the dimer changes and makes it very carcinogenic. So again, it's a matter of Degree, how much do you drink, how much you don't. But people who drink a dozen or more a day, and there are people who do. So they're at risk. Okay, I talked to you about uh, proto oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and then oncogenes. Now, what is it that makes treating cancer with chemotherapy so difficult? And we're going to have to end here because it's five o'clock. This gives you a, a, an appreciation for how difficult it is. And that's why you've got to be treated in a top level cancer center. Because cell kinetics are very complex, very difficult to deal with. And this pertains overwhelmingly to leukemics. And uh, Pastor Chris was talking to me about that today with the, the children that he is involved with. So here's the, here's the issue. Say you have a bacterial infection. Bacterial infection down here. And you treat it with an antibiotic. And you give a dose here, a dose there, and it doesn't kill the bacteria. But you can go and increase it more and more and more, all the way up to here. So you have a really tremendous range to go before it causes death. 
Now let's look at cancer. Cancer, you remember, as I said, you're treating poison with poison, very, very powerful drugs. Well, this is the cancer picture. You start here, have lymphoblastoma, uh, or acute lymphocytic leukemia, who knows. But you go up and up, or here, up, 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 very short distance. And then you can't go any further because if you go further, death, too toxic. So you have a much, much smaller window. So what they do is have to look at the cell kinetics, the, the dividing of the cells that are being killed. And it's very, very complex work that requires great expertise. And so you're dealing with this little window as opposed to this great big window. That's what makes it so difficult. Now, just before we take off, I just want to end with this. This gives you an idea of all the new cutting edge things that are happening in cancer. The bone marrow transplants, the multiple myeloma, a recombinant DNA, um, which actually deletes the specific genes in the tumor. Um, monoclonal antibodies, using antibodies of, against your own tumor. Remarkable. Interferon, viral stimulated uh, defense uh, interference, and interleukin T2, T, T2 cells or thymus cells, which are your defense cells. And that, those are the cytokines being used now. But they've got to be used very carefully because if they, again, too much one way or the other, <laughs> um, there's the cyber knife, the gamma knife, gamma radiation knife, where they go in and surgically extirpate. Um, and uh, the genome atlas. And the breakthrough of recently is the epithelial growth factor, the um, EGF. Those are all new things on the horizon that are being applied. So we've come a long, long way. A long way to go, but the point is, cancer is not a death sentence now like it was 50 years ago. And then the witch doctor, he told me what to do. He told me, ooh, ooh.